Hello everyone, welcome to an all new episode of the Indic Explorer show. This is your host Vineet. Please don't forget to like, comment, comment, share and subscribe to the channel. Indian history has many different phases. But the most important part of our history is when, where did it all start from? And there has been a lot of narratives globally and in India in the history in the larger, wider history community on the roots of Indian civilization. Today, to talk about this topic and to bust and demystify a lot of myths and to, you know, give us clarity on the reality as to what the actual history is, I have a very special guest, Major General G.D. Bakshi Ji. Namaste, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So you would have all seen him on primetime news. On a lighter note, I just wanted to ask you, where have you had more kills of Pakistanis during your military career or after retirement in the news channels? <laughs> I, 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 I'd say my military career was more fruitful because there were about 40 Pakistani soldiers killed at Kargil and over 145 wounded. And then when I was fighting in uh, Kishtwar, there were 108 terrorists killed there. And then I, when I fought in uh, Rajauri and Punch, another 108 terrorists were eliminated. <laughs> so that was, I would say, a more productive shooting session. <laughs> I mean, I must say that your takedown of the anti-nationals is like poetry on screen. So... <laughs> So, uh, anyways, coming back to the topic, uh, your book, The Saraswati Civilization, if you may just show the cover. There you are. So, this is the book, The Saraswati Civilization by Major General G.D. Bakshi. Uh, I think everyone should buy this book and read it. Uh, yeah. So, let's delve deeper into uh, the subject. So, uh, General Bakshi... Why did you decide to write this book? What exactly, uh, you know, inspired you to do this work? You know, uh, the colonial era historians, they had an agenda. They had an axe to grind. It was their endeavor to show that to justify colonial rule in India, that just as they were outsiders to India, so were the Aryans. They said, you are invaders, so what right have you to crib or gripe about the fact that we have invaded and conquered India? You came from outside, you conquered India, you are aliens, we are aliens. So, you know, as they say in the Hindi vernacular, chor chor musere bhai, you got no right to crib against uh, the imposition of colonial, western colonial rule in India. So, the first uh, distortion in our history that they started with is that the Aryans are not indigenous. The Aryans are invaders. The Aryans had come from outside, Central Asia, Anatolia, wherever. You know, Europe, <laughs> the, the, the uh, you know, the Aryan uh, homeland kind of a thesis went all over Europe. It was sometimes placed in, uh, uh, you know, Germany, sometimes in Romania, sometimes in Russia other times in Turkish uh, Anatolia, you know, the Urheitmark, the Aryan homeland, was placed all over, anywhere but India. And they said they came from outside to India. And, you know, there was a fatwa passed by Max Muller. Max Muller, the so-called doyen of uh, colonial historians, he said that the Aryans came to India somewhere around 1500 BCE and they wrote the Vedas around 1200 BCE. And how did he come to this fantastical calculation? He did a back of the envelope calculation. He says, you know, the Buddhist Sutra period is 600 BCE. So give 200 years each. You know, he was rather generous. 200 years each for the Upanishad period, the Brahman period and then the Vedas period. So, 600, 600, 1200 BCE, quad era demonstrator. It is amazing how this flippant back of the envelope calculation 
has become a fatwa. You know, it is cast in stone. You dare not question it because Max Muller or Gora wrote it. I mean, it is it is uh, fantastical. It is amazing how this piece of flippant back of the envelope calculation could become such a cast in stone axiom of Indian history, which just could not be tampered with, could not be changed. And uh, Romila Thapad will have a fit. She'll froth at the mouth if you tell her that, oh no, Max Muller was wrong. What is the proof that Max Muller had for this kind of a flippant calculation? And it went against all other, you know, uh, evidences that we have found, whether archaeological, geological, you know, climatology-wise, genetic mapping-wise, you know, carbon dating-wise, everything goes against this fatwa. But it has become an edict. And therefore, I wanted to question some of these, uh, you know, uh, Western paradigms, uh, historical, colonial, historic, uh, colonial historiography thrust on us, thrust on our, down our throats, you know, and uh, uh, the American history is not written by the British. The Russian, the Chinese, the French history is not written in Oxford and Cambridge. Why does Indian history only have to be sourced from there? We are not capable of uh, uh, finding out our own historical truths, our own historical realities. Only they could be objective, the Goras, when they had uh, an agenda, which I have told you very clearly, to justify colonial rule in India. They would twist facts. They would twist our history and ram it down our throats. The pity is it they have left 75 years ago. You don't have to hang on to colonial aprons and hang on to the colonial tail. But, this, but the honest fact is, that in India, there is a set of leftist liberal historians who have taken themselves to be guardians of the colonial narrative, who feel that the, 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 the brown people, the, you know, the, the, we, we cannot dare challenge what the Goras, uh, you know, uh, pontificated to us. I'm afraid the weight of archaeological evidence geological evidence, satellite imagery evidence, numismatic evidence, the dating, carbon dating, uh, fluoride dating, sonoluminescence dating, you know, so many of these scientific techniques, genetic mapping, they are all telling you a vastly different story. Why we are supposed to, you know, uh, faithfully follow the archaic anachronistic colonial narrative I can't understand and therefore yeah. I thought one is that you keep complaining about lack of change the other is get up and do your own research and come and say your piece that's what I've decided to do to challenge the colonial narratives to challenge the colonial so, historiography with facts I'm not talking of a saffronization of history I'm talking of basing our history on empirical facts, hard facts. That is that's, the that's the key. The that's the key because to be able to do that, sometimes people do get emotional. But when we are able to present an academic response, that's when we truly make an impact. So uh, I believe uh, so. There's a presentation that you uh, wanted yes. to uh, talk about. So I'll just share the screen. You know, I'd like to start with a few uh, quotations from Western scholars mostly, but uh, they are very illustrative. There's a Chinese saying, to destroy a people, you must first destroy their history. I think it's so apt and it says everything that has to be said about the topic. Then there is Dian Lichtenstein, an American scholar, who said, as data accumulates, to support cultural continuity in South Asian prehistoric and historic periods. Note that carefully. Prehistoric and historic period, there is, a, uh, there is a cultural continuity, a considerable restructuring of existing interpretive paradigms must take place. She says, we reject most strongly the simplistic historical interpretations 
which date back to the 18th century and continue to be imposed on South Asian cultural history. She is very specifically <coughs> re referring to the colonial historian. These still prevailing interpretations are significantly diminished by European ethnocentrism, colonialism, racism, and anti-Semitism. I don't think anybody could get more emphatic than this. And this is not an Indian right-wing uh, scholar, you know, tilting at the windmills. This is a very serious American scholar of Indian history. And then there is Malaroy who said, one does not ask, where is the Indo-European homeland? But rather, where do they place it now? That depends so much on the politics and geopolitics of each era. So to start with, I'd like to contextualize the topic by, you know, this slide of some very apt quotations. Next, please. So as I said, there is a, a, a very palpable need to reinterpret Indian history, especially ancient history and modern history. Ancient history, because that tells us who we are. What is our identity? Are you aliens? Are you invaders? Or are you the original people of the Asian uh, landmass of uh, the subcontinent of India? So today India needs to reclaim its own history. Can you imagine French, Russian or Chinese history being subcontracted to American universities? This happened to us because of the slavish mindset that we acquired over two centuries of colonial rule. So today, as I said, we need to reclaim our history and reinterpret it in the light of new facts and knowledge that have emerged in multiple fields of inquiry. We therefore need an integrated, convergent and multidisciplinary approach to solving some of the riddles of Indology. The colonial and Marxist historians have been strenuously denying the historicity of the Saraswati River. As Romila Thapad would have it, there was no major river called Saraswati in India. There was a dirty nala called Heraksavati in Afghanistan, which started from a swamp and disappeared in the desert sands. And that was Saraswati. That was Heraksavati, as she would have us believe. And there was no river called Saraswati. You know, they deny the existence, the historicity of one of the most important source rivers of the Indian civilization called the Saraswati. So we have to go back to the basics. We have to fight that issue from there for. The colonial historians propagated the Aryan invasion theory, the AIT. Now later when, you know, they themselves found there were big, big holes in this theory, very deftly, you know, it was turned to the Indo-Aryan migration theory. Oh, there was no invasion. There was no mass murder. There was no genocide. You know, Indra was not guilty of genocide, as Sir Maltimer Wheeler said. But, you know, they had waves of invasion, you know, waves after waves after waves of migration, right? And for some strange reason, the Indian girls, the Indian ladies decided to chuck their husbands, their males, and marry with them in mass. So that the entire genetic composition of North India was changed. Without any war, without any conquest. If you say, yes, they won the war and these were all slaves, well, then we can understand. But firstly, you say there is no evidence of war, there is no evidence of mass slaughter. And then you say that just a series of mass migrations, you know, changed the very genetic composition of the North Indian plains. Uh, today, instead of the Aryan invasion theory, we have adequate evidence for an OOT, out of India theory, and I shall dwell on that a little later. We also need to resolve the questions of age and antiquity. The colonial historian started from the biblical mindset that the world started 4,500 years ago. And quite obviously, it started in Mesopotamia and the Middle East from where the Bible arose. So how could anything predate Mesopotamia? Simple colonial logic. Nothing can predate Mesopotamia. Nothing can predate that uh, biblical civilization and what they said there. So quite obviously India 
you know, the, the Vedas were written in 1200 BCE, as Max Muller said, and as I told you. Next, please. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, what is the uh, course of the Saraswati River, uh, like, you know, in terms of source and where does it end into? So, what, what would be the areas that yeah, it yeah. covers? So, there are some seminal questions in Indian history, which I would like to outline at the very start and we'll try and answer them. Which was the cradle river of the Indian civilization? Indus or Saraswati? Seminal question. You know, by the time the Greeks came, the Saraswati had dried out. So, they didn't see any Saraswati river. They saw only the Indus. And they from Indus, they said Indus, Indica, India. So, the name India comes to us from the Indus river, which the Greeks said, the Greeks said, contrary to fact, was the source river of the Indian civilization. The Arabs came 7th century AD and they also did not see the Saraswati because of the simple fact that it had already dried out, desiccated by then. So, they said Sindhu, since they couldn't pronounce the S, they pronounced it as Hindu and from Hindu it became Hindustan and Hinduism, right? So, this is a very basic question. Is it the Indus or is it the Saraswati? I'll try and prove to you that it was the Saraswati. Did the civilizational area of Harap that corresponds to the sacred geography of the Rig Veda, was it the Rig Vedic civilization or was it a different civilization? Basic question. You know, if you see the geographical area of the Sapta Sindhava, you know, of the Vedic civilization, it is exactly the area of the Indus Valley civilization. They shared the same geographical locale. So, were they the same civilization or as, you know, uh, 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 you know, Max Muller would have us believe, they were separated by about 2000 years in time. It's a very important question. So, was the Saraswati civilization, therefore, the original Aryan homeland and was Sanskrit the proto-Indo-European language? You know, Sir Jones and a lot of other Western scholars, this, they found out remarkable similarities in Sanskrit and the Indo-European languages, group of languages, Persian and Russian and, uh, you know, Ukrainian and all these languages, they have a common base, Latin and Greek. There are lots of commonalities in language. So, from there, they said there had to be a common uh, Indo-European culture and a common Indo-European homeland from where this language, proto-Indo-European languages must have originated. My thesis is the reverse. That Indo-European Aryan homeland was along the Indus Saraswati tract, right? And Sanskrit was the proto-Indo-European language. I'll try and substantiate this thesis. Carbon dating puts the antiquity of the Indus Saraswati civilization to beyond 9,500 years before present. It is therefore the cradle of human civilization given its age, antiquity and the amazing degree of persistence and sheer cultural continuity, which I will explain. So, the basic question is, are the Aryans indigenous or alien to India? Are the Indus Saraswati and Rig Vedic civilizations one at the same? Does that account for the amazing degree of culture continuity with present-day Hinduism of the Indo-Saraswati civilizational tract? We missed the entire body of evidence in plain sight because of a deeply entrenched mindset that these two civilizations were separated in time, even if they occupied the same geographical area, which is the Max Muller thesis. So, you know, we had in 2019 conducted a multidisciplinary seminar at the Delhi University and I had gotten that conducted. So, we had five sessions and in the first session, we had taken a look at colonial historiography and discuss the Aryan invasion theory and the Indo-Aryan migration theory. In the second session, we called satellite imagery experts, you know, and uh, ISRO experts who had come and given us satellite imagery evidence of the existence of the, of the 
dried out course of the in the Saraswati of the Saraswati River, right? And then we had called the geologists to give us geological evidence. We had called hydrodynamics experts who are experts in the river channels, paleo channels, and how they change over time. In the third session, we had called the archaeologists. In specific, Dr. B. B. Lal, who just died recently, and uh, Dr. Bisht, doyens of uh, archaeology, they had come and presented papers. In the fourth session, we had called the genetic experts, DNA experts, and they had told us about genetic mapping of the population and genetic studies which prove or disprove the Aryan invasion theory. And fifth session, we had talked of linguistic and script, uh, scriptural evidence and uh, Kalyana Raman and other very famous scholars had come and we were very lucky to have uh, Rajiv Malhotra, you know, of the Infinity Foundation also present at this seminar. So we had quite a set of luminaries. Next, please. Take a look at this, uh, you know, a word, a picture is worth a thousand words. Now, this slide shows you the Indus River, which is on uh, on the north. And below that, parallel to that, is the Saraswati River, right? And the purple dots are the human settlements, towns, villages, uh, uh, and uh, there are about 10 major cities there, right? The purple dots that you see. Now, one look at this will show you that the density of the settlements is much more in fact, 80% of the settlements are along the Saraswati tract Correct. and not along not the Indus. Indus. They are just Correct. the outliers. Yeah, they are all, all very, tells you, very well spread out actually. They are not clustered together the way this out is. And yeah. they, were, they were the outliers of the Saraswati civilization. The basic civilization is not the Indus civilization. It's another thing that we first discovered the monument, the, the ruins at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa along the in the tract because the Saraswati had dried out. But if you take a look in the Rajasthan area, that was the core of the civilizational area. And then around, around Delhi, Hastinapur, Haryana, you see the first dense, clun, the dense cluster along yeah. the so-called Ghaggar Saraswati river, right? Yeah. Now, at one glance, this tells you everything that has to be said. Indus is not the mother river of the Indian civilization. It is an outlier. Right? What you had was outposts. The major river, mother river was the Saraswati. And one look at the density of the settlement tells you where the, where the so-called Indus Valley civilization people really lived. That is why we are technically calling it the Indus Saraswati civilization. And even more technically, it would be the Saraswati in the civilization. Correct. One look at this slide is adequate to explain this. And that is why I show it to scholars. Here is empirical proof, empirical evidence. Now, the Nadi Sukta of the Rig Veda lists seven sacred streams as the Sapta Sindhava, the land of the seven rivers. That is the sacred geography of the Rig Veda. Now, surprisingly, as I said, this is the same area as the Harappan civilization. So, the question comes, were these two the same? The Rig Veda emphasizes not the Ganga, as the, which is now the holiest of all Indian rivers, but the mythical stream of the Saraswati as the most sacred river of India. Right? In the Vedic times, this river was considered the most mightiest river of India. It was called Sindhumata. It was called Nadi Tama, the greatest of all rivers. Devi Tama, the greatest of all goddesses. And Anuttama, the greatest of all mothers. In fact, this name of the Saraswati is mentioned 74 times in the Rig Veda. And it finds mention in all the subsequent Vedas. The only thing that you notice is that the references become less and less and less as we go down the age. From the Rig to the Sam to the Yajur to the Atharva, the least mentions are in the Atharva. And in the Atharva Veda, it's mentioned more as the source of our Pitris, that our, that our forefathers lived there. It is referred oh. to as the greatest river, glorious, loudly roaring, mother of floods. 
that means it was not some dying out stream it was a mighty river so when max muller writes that the veda the vedas were written in 1200 bce the geologists tell you that the saraswati had dried out by 1900 bce right so that means when the aryans as per max muller came to india this would not even have been a dry nala existent it would, it would have not, not have been existent so that means the vedas were lying when they said the greatest of rivers loudly roaring mother of floods mother of floods does not translate into a piddly stream you see this is important to remember because the but you know the interesting part, thing you mentioned uh, general sir the interesting yeah. thing that you mentioned here is that in the atharva veda by that time yeah it has already become a river like you know a, a something that our ancestors were uh, yeah, you know kind yeah, of yeah. looking up to so Absolutely. that kind of shows that matlab atharva ved ka matlab timeline kind of goes somewhere around there like uh, somewhere around there but let's not forget that you know even in the atharva ved you are talking of uh, previous times you are talking of exactly. earlier times you know correct, uh, correct. That, that the rishis of your so they even before us you know they also they are talking even of ancient time and the athar veda may have been compiled later but a number of the verses the rishis are common those who have written in the rig veda have also been there in the atharva so the vedas were received much earlier they were codified by vyasa much later so the last of them to be really codified is the atharva veda right but you are right in terms of time sequencing it comes later to the rig the yajur the sam and the yajur next please you know they say don't tell us the americans say don't tell us show us so here it is sir here is a satellite photograph of the dried out bed of the saraswati river you know it was first taken by a landsat american satellite in the 1970s they were the first ones to flash back the dried out bed of a mighty river called the saraswati in india right along the course of the ghaggar hakra alignment this is actual live photograph now uh, this may not be you may not be able to interpret it as a low male man so the next image you know there are you can see in deep blue ink blue the indus river and you can see in sky blue you know the the saraswati river alignment which runs parallel sure. to the so called the gagar hakra alignment even now the, those are seasonal rivers and uh, uh, you know uh, if you fly in an aeroplane from here to mumbai from delhi to mumbai you will see a number of longitudinal lakes long lakes which are the remnants of the saraswati right and the big lake at uh, kurukshetra how is it that you know for all our shrad we are supposed to go to kurukshetra for dispersal of ashes we go to the ganga why do we go to the kurukshetra because the saraswati flowed through there Wow. you see the strength of the indian oral tradition the indian tradition of having to go to the saraswati to uh, worship your ancestors our pitris the pitru you know, you know so now this was a river 4600 kilometers long 6 to 8 kilometers wide and north of patiala you know the satluj river used to join the the saraswati and the yamuna used to join the saraswati and get it the ice melt water of the himalayas you understand it was 20 kilometers wide there those dry channel beds have been picked up by the satellites so romila thapad can be dammed you know she can go and wash her feet in the hexaravati dirty nala in afghanistan we have found empirical solid evidence of the existence of the saraswati not only as a trickle stream but a mighty river mightier than the brahmaputra i have a question general sir i i i have a question here so you're mentioning that the satluj which today joins yes. into the indus uh used to merge into saraswati so i believe the course might have changed once the saraswati dried up yes, right so this i yeah yeah so this i can kind of understand but you mentioned yeah. yamuna also joined uh Absolutely. the saraswati i want to understand because yamuna is flowing now, eastwards now, right and saraswati is going westwards. westwards 
I, I will show you slides, specific slides on that. So, as per satellite imagery of the desiccated channel, Saraswati was 4,600 kilometer long, average width 6 to 8 kilometers, flowed from Himalayas to the sea through Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Sindh in Pakistan, and then into Gujarat. I told you at Patiala it was joined by the Yamuna and the Satlaj. And tectonic plate shifts caused the Yamuna and Satlaj to change course and be captured. The Yamuna was captured by the Ganga and the Satlaj was captured by the Indus. And thereafter, the Saraswati became a monsoonal stream and due to monotonic weakening of the monsoons, dried out completely. A Meghalian period is mentioned around 1900 BCE, you know, at which there were a drought lasting 200 years. The Nile dried out to a great extent, the Euphrates died out, and the Saraswati dried out. And all these ancient civilizations along the Nile, along the Euphrates, and along the Saraswati, they died out then, right? It was in the north, reduced to a string of disconnected lakes and pools, and south of Jaisalmer, at a place called Vinashana. Vinashana means destruction. This river went underground. And today, you know, the army has been boring wells there along the Saraswati course and there are lakhs of liters of sweet water flowing 60 to 100 meters below the surface. You understand? We can green the desert if we get it wow. out. We can green the desert if we get it out. Yeah. You know, as as per Max Muller, yeah. Aryans invaded India in 1500 BCE and composed the Vedas here 1200 BCE. Why would they come to an area of water stress? When a river is dying out, do yeah. people rush there to die? Simple, basic question, common sense. Do people come to a dying river which is turning <laughs> into a desert? I ask you. Right? And uh, yeah. they rather go out from there. And that is our thesis. That the Aryans went out. They were forced to go out. If there is a eco-catastrophe, you don't hang around there to die. More people don't come. is a good place to die. Come here. They come to where it is lush and green. And from the dry desert sands of Central Asia, if people have to come all the way, they don't come all the way to die in another desert. They come only when it is lush and fertile. You know, so that must be borne in mind. Next slide, please. My question here is, uh, now uh, two questions actually. One is, you mentioned about them going out, right? Uh, at the same time, uh, General Sir, the Ganga and the Yamuna were still flowing. So why didn't they go eastwards? Why did the they next, go westwards? The next slide will explain the, to you because we got the geological experts and the hydro channel experts to talk to us on this. So we'll show you in the next slide. Very logical question. And the other thing actually, I, I just want to uh, say, uh, tell this out here. Yeah. The Triveni Sangam, yeah. which is in Prayagraj, is supposed to be a merging of Ganga, yeah. Yamuna and Saraswati, right? So, what about yeah. that? Yeah. That also yeah. I, yeah. I'm yeah. kind of curious you know, to know. Every time you go to the, the Prayagraj and the boatman takes you there, you know, he tells you that this is the Ganga, that other, that other lighter colored stream is the Yamuna and the Saraswati is uh, invisible. It went underground, you know. The Saraswati is actually gone underground yeah. at Vinashana, right? It's actually gone underground at Vinashana. And the simple fact is that in oral memory, the Yamuna meets the Saraswati. The Yamuna meets the Saraswati. Now, just take a look at this map. Now, this map, you know, okay. uh, shows you, if you see the Ghaggar Hakra Paleo Channel, which is in very light blue, you know, that is the course of the Saraswati, Right? And the Yamuna used to be joining it, which is now turning towards the east, right? And the Satlaj also was joining this. Now I'll explain in the next slide. Next, please. Like they said, what happened to the Saraswati? How did the Saraswati die? The process started in 4,700 4, years before present when a massive earthquake shook northern India. As a consequence of the tectonic plate shift, it caused a sheer fault in the Shivaliks which I'll show you now, satellite photographs, which made the Yamuna River change course, turn east and join the Ganga. 
listen to this carefully the it's sheer fault in the shiva leaks made the yamuna turn course and join the ganga i'll show you more of that 2600 yeah. years before present there was another tectonic plate shift and as a result the satluj shifted course westward and became a tributary of the indus river the mighty saraswati now lost its perennial source as i mentioned to you and it gradually had to die out and uh, there is that meghalayan era in which all major rivers dried out because of a 200 years drought so ice melt water gone it becomes a monsoonal stream which now takes uh, source from adibadri you know and then even that dries out even that dries out next please so i'll just show you but the memory of that mighty river has been preserved that ran ran from the himalayas to the sea has been preserved in our oral tradition collective memory for over thousands of years which is amazing even today the boatman in uh, prayagraj will tell you that the three rivers used to meet here you know so next let's go next so you're saying uh, i i wanted to ask you so you're saying that it was more of an oral memory it, the river actually never met at prayagraj but just the fact that yamuna and saraswati used to meet is the reason why it's remembered as a trivedi now sun. now the archaeologists are also saying that there was another stream called the saraswati which came from the uttarakhand uttra khand himalayas joined the, them at this place uh-huh. and since the yamuna at that at that time was flowing that side you know it was there but we don't have uh-huh. very concrete evidence of that so my reckoning is that the since the saraswati and the yamuna were uh, flowing together once uh-huh. you know the tradition has come that they were all uh, joint streams you know triveni triveni One. isko bola jata hai got it uh, got it but we don't have much evidence it, for that it. really but in the oral memory the three rivers okay. are linked now let me show you how let me show you how next slide now take a look at this this is a satellite photograph of the shivaliks you know the dark brown uh, finger like things that you can see in the north of this slide and then you see the sheer cut the fault you know at ponta sahib you see that the yamuna used to flow yeah. more towards the east more towards the east which i'll show you in the next slide but because of this sheer fault it is now flowing through this gap because it found an easier route so what it was going and joining westward it turned east now i'll show you how next slide now this this shows you how you see if you see this, this there is a yamuna y3 which is the present channel if you see next to it in dotted lines there is a yamuna y2 yeah which is how it changed when it came via ponta sahib and there is a y1 you know where the yamuna is joining the saraswati you see this it it now shows you very very clearly this is the three shifts y1 y2 y3 channel in which as per as per uh, paleo channel experts the yamuna shifted course and from joining the saraswati to the west it turns eastwards and it joins the yamuna y3 is the present channel y2 is the second shift paleo channel and then you have uh, the y1 channel which is the yamuna uh, in its westward uh, turn when it was joining the saraswati Sir. if you read the mahabharat if you so, read uh, the mahabharat the battlefield huh. of the mahabharat is supposed to be between the saraswati and the drishadvati you know the opening para of the of the stanza of the mahabharat uh, gives the geographical location of uh, the mahabharat battlefield and it says it was between the drishadvati which is the yamuna channel and the saraswati drishadvati channel is the channel of the yamuna next let's go next yeah i have a question yeah. this y2 yeah. channel uh, of the yamuna so yeah. y3 is clear it merges with ganga and y1 uh, was with saraswati where would y2 go like where y2 also was joining the saraswati huh. a bit ahead okay a okay ahead. So got it it is it is moved in it's moved in three Direction. three shifts okay three shifts it is sort of moved got it next now this is you know around uh, around around jaisalmer where this river has gone underground at a place called vinashna it just vanished the whole st- stream has gone underground and which has been mapped fully mapped now the underground channels of this river 60 to 80 meters 
and then 100 to 120 meters, two separate channels, layers of channels, you know, and the water has goes back to the, you know, almost 10,000 years BCE and, and earlier, you know. And uh, Vinashana is the place where even in the Mahabharat, you know, there is a very interesting story of how when the war was about to start, Balaram was disgusted. He said, I'll have no part in this war. And he took a, undertook a pilgrimage along the source of the Saraswati River. And when he came to Vinashna, it said it had disappeared. It had gone underground. And then when he came up the source, he found there was a drought. And the river was drying up. In Mahabharat, this is mentioned. Have you understood? And this is the place Vinashna from where it has gone underground. And like I said, if we dig plenty of uh, bore wells, we can get lakhs of liters of sweet water and green the desert in that area. Where is the exact right? place in this uh, map in of Vinashna? Yes, where? Uh, MNK, when it is talking of MNK. MMK, okay. Yeah, that this is place. The place from where it has gone underground, you know, Achha. where it has gone underground channel Got it. of the of this river. Huh? Okay. And, uh, which has been which we have mapped it accurately. The geologists have mapped it and uh, and uh, we've dug bore wells and we have sweet water coming up there. Sweet water coming up there. Next, okay. please. So, like I said, 60% of the sites have been found not on the Indus Valley. And in fact, that is not 60%. It is 80%. You know? uh, so, therefore, the Greeks and the Arabs all got it wrong. And the cradle river of the Indian civilization then becomes the Saraswati. Because as I showed you the slide, and we shall see it again next. Yeah, as we shall oh. see again, 80% of the sites are along the Saraswati and right. not the Indus. So, it's a misnomer to say that the Indus is the source of the Indian civilization or the, mm. uh, the mother river of the Indian civilization. And here is a satellite photograph which shows you the Indus in violet. And it shows you these clusters not on the Indus, but in Rajasthan and in New Delhi and around. In, in, in you know, in, in, in Kurukshetra, in Haryana, those dense clusters you see north of Delhi, yeah. the dense cluster. So there yeah. is the real Indian civilization, the Vedic civilization was here clustered around here. Hastinapur and here, you know, and not on the Indus. You see how thin yeah. it is on the Indus, the settlements. <laughs> you know, just because you found Mohenjo-daro first doesn't mean that becomes the mother river. Next, yeah. please. Also, I think the Indus was like a border of some kind. Maybe that's the first place they encountered. That doesn't mean that that's it is right, the central right. location. River, of the... Central mother river of the Indian civilization. Yeah. Because we saw it first. <laughs> that's. I mean, it's completely their point of view, right? Their lens. That is right. That is yeah. right. The, the dumb part is, why are we supposed to accept it? Exactly. It's Just our. Right in in fact, it is the exact opposite. It's the periphery of our civilization. <laughs> it is absolute periphery of our civilization, and not the core, yeah. like it has been made out to be by yeah. Mortimer Wheeler and a whole lot of other uh, Western archaeologists. Now let's come to archaeological evidence. We've taken a look at the geological evidence, the paleological yeah. evidence, the satellite imagery evidence. Now. Let's take a look at archaeological evidence. And some of the best work was done by Professors Lal and Professor Bisht, doyens of Indian, uh, you know, historians. And, uh, you know, we've not been able to decipher the Indus Valley script. But what we have found is hundreds and almost thousands of terracotta dolls and statuettes and toys. Terracotta, right? And these tell a story of their own. They are a proto-language. You know, uh, an artist will record what he's seeing. What kind of bullock carts, what kind of boats, what kind of uh, ornaments. He'll record that in his terracotta imagery. Right? And that is a kind of a proto-language. And that tells you of an amazing degree of cultural continuity between the Saraswati Rig Vedic civilization and modern day Sanatan Dharma, modern day Hinduism. Right? Now, once again, I will not uh, talk theory. They, I will say, don't tell us, show us. So let's go to the next slide. Take a look at this. 
these are two statuettes of women which have been found in the area of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. And actually, because it is, a, you know, faded out and you may not make out, but if you see on the right, the girl in the right, the woman depicted on the right uh, slide of the slide in orange, you see the vermilion mark in the center parting of a hair? Yeah. There is red vermilion marking in the center this... parting of the hair, which the Indian women still do today. Your mom would be putting her sandur there today. And if you see closely, it is faded out, but there is a bindi in the center of the forehead of both. Both these statues. I can and make out in this one. Yeah, you here. can make it out very clearly. In the actual, it is much more clear. Since these are in the left one, I am not able ah, to. I think clear. this is the place. Just her. This is this is the place. Right, me, mujhe dikh raha hai. Raha hai. right, me, bilkul clear dikh raha hai. You know, huh. and they have the vermilion in the center parting of their hair, and they had bindis yeah. in the center of their foreheads. Now, right. the Birhana settlement in the Saraswati has been dated huh. back, carbon dated, sir, to 9,500 years before present. So the tradition is 9,500 years old. Can you get us a civilization which is older? Not the Chinese, not the Egyptian, not the Mesopotamian. They can't hold a candle to us in terms of sheer age and antiquity combined with cultural continuity. Okay. You see the bangles on the arms of that statuette, bronze statuette. And you see the bangles on the yeah. arm of present day women in Saurashtra. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think the, it, 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 it speaks for itself. <laughs> It speaks for itself. Yeah. Look at the continuity. Look at the continuity. Next, please. I'll show you more examples of this continuity. Yeah. You know, these are terracotta dolls found in the postures of Hatha Yoga. Terracotta mm. dolls found in the postures of Hatha Yoga. <laughs> and in the next one, we'll show you clear because, you know, they've done, because these are very small, they've done drawings of these. Take a look at these. You see these asanas? You see, now, oh. now you see these slides of the terracotta. You can see the Vajrasana. Yeah, very it's clearly. very clear. And it's extremely yeah. clear, the yogic postures. You know, the, the Namaskar Mudra, you know, is, is, is so clear into all of these. And the Pavan Muktasan, you can see. Right? You can see this, the, the, the Padmasan. Right? And uh, the Vajrasana. So many of these asanas, you can see the Vajrasana is in the third uh, right, top third right. That is Vajrasana. You see? So these yogic asanas go back well beyond 5,000 years. Yoga... We still do them. Eh? They we still go. do these asanas. There we, is... we are still doing it. So like I said, yeah. it is not just the antiquity. It is the continuity which is a greater miracle. Continuity of our cultural, civilizational moods. And the late motive of the Indian or the Indic or the Hindu civilization is yoga and meditation. Right? And you will find both examples in the so-called in the Saraswati Valley civilization. Now somebody, the British historians dated this, these uh, statuettes from Harappa to 2500 BCE, which is about 4500 years ago. But that's not on the basis of carbon dating. I mean, that was a British colonial, uh, this thing, you know, and uh, now we have carbon dating. So these are, go far, you know, the antiquity of the Indian civilization can really be stretched back. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. What is this man doing? As per the British historians, he was uh, dozing or doping or sleeping. I'm sorry, sir. Here is a man who is doing meditation. See the beauty of his robe. See the beauty of his robe. You know, his eyes half closed. This man is meditating. So if you have any doubt, see the next slide. Yeah. This is the famous Pashupati Nath scene. The Pashupati Nath, Lord of the animals, surrounded by animals. See him surrounding by all 
various types of animals. Pashupati Nath in meditation. Shiva in meditation. And if you got any doubt that you know it is Shiva, see the next slide. <laughs> you see the Shiva Linga. Easy to identify as it. You see the Shiva Linga. Yeah. And I do. I'm yeah. very sure nobody has any doubt on what this is. Go to the National Museum and see in the <laughs> Indus Valley section, so-called this Shiva Linga is not one. But there are three or four. There are three or four. They have also found fire altars. You know the the home cook uh, cooking fire. The altars were round. You know for home cooking. You know Griha okay. yeah. Agni. But the but the Yagna Agni was square altar. Or falcon shaped, Square, huh? shaped like a falcon, Sena, right? Those altars have been found. Yupas, sacrificial pillars, where they used to sacrifice the animals, they have been found. And if you see on the right side of this slide, what leaf is that? Can you make out? People. See the top, top layer. Oh. Below that is a trident. And on okay. the top is the people. The people tree goes that old. Okay. You see the cultural hmm. continuity, the amazing degree of cultural continuity in this civilization. Next, please. This is a bullock cart toy that has been discovered in the so-called Indus Valley civilization. This is a boat. And I've got a picture of the boat still used in Gujarat. And you see the seals, the boats on the sea. They're so, so similar. Go to the next. You know what this is? If you ever studied in a village school, this is the fatty on which they used to teach. <laughs> Make you write the alphabet. <laughs> Make you write the numbers. <laughs> and then put Geru on it again. This is the fatty which was being discovered in the in the Valley civilizational area. And these fatties are still used in some villages to teach. Look at the level of continuity, sir. The design of the houses is just exactly the same with a courtyard in the center and a tulsi ka patta in between. The, the shape of the, of the furrows in the fields is exactly the same as it was you know, in the Indus Valley civilization and as it is done today. Next slide, please. This is some of the beautiful pottery that has been found there. You get the same designs now in aluminium or... Uh, you know, China or whatever, but look at the beauty of this pottery and the painting that was done. Red ochre wear, slip wear on these on this pottery which has been discovered in that uh, uh, Indus Valley civilization. Next, please. Now, this is very interesting. You know, on the right slide, that red mm. mushroom that you see is supposed to be the Amanita yeah. Muscaria. Uh, R. Gordon Wasson, the German botanist, felt this was Soma. That this was Soma. Right? And if you see the statuette which has been found in the Indus Valley civilization, the two statuettes which have been found, in fact, there is a third statuette also, you know, uh, 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 two statues which have been found. You see the discs on the head with the dots. And you see the dotted mushroom. You see oh. the Soma. And this has also been found yeah. in South America. Yeah. In the in the Aztec Inca civilizations, these similar kind of you know polka dotted mushrooms on the head, which are supposed to be soma, it's supposed to be one right. of the variants of the botanical okay. identity of the so-called soma plant. Next, please. This is the red mushroom, which uh, R. Gordon Wasson, the German botanist, said is soma. They're very brilliant. It's still <laughs> found in the Himalayas. It's still found in Nilgiri. Acha, they are. Oh, they're they are still they found, are found in Himalayas and Nilgiri. Oh. I have collected them myself. Brilliant red with white spots. You know. Acha. Amazing plant. Amazing plant. This was supposed to. And I these are. Uh, just wanted to ask you: Are these, uh, are these no, uh, edible are mushrooms or are these Psycho the other kind of? They can give you. Acha. Hallucinations. These are. Samaj gaya. Ha. You know, huh? yeah, yeah, got it. Soma got was supposed to give it. you ecstasy, a high. Supposed to creative, give you, yeah, ecstasy, right? correct. But there are many yeah. views on whether this was the yeah. real Soma plant because so many substitutes have happened because the Vedas call it Som Lata. Uh -huh. Som Lata, right? And that means it was a creeper plant. 
green right and it was crushed the stalks were like you know knotted fingers and all that you know which were crushed by the priests with stones and all that to take out the green soma juice so those are various theories but this is one of them and this psychotropic mushroom has been used in central asia in the himalayas in uh, china and also in south america quite a lot quite a lot in south america now here is a view of the uh, you know the 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 mohenjo daro from the top right and you see it's like a chess board right. like a game of chess it's sort of made out like that and it has mm. protective walls around to encampments and to the left is the citadel area you know where the priests lived or where the high priests lived and the royal gentry or their thing though the uh, town square town square and all the granaries were there in that area and the artisans and common people lived in other segments next please look at the drainage system i'm afraid it is better than the drainage system we have in delhi gurgaon or mumbai because one rains and you know what happens so this was a remarkable drainage system <laughs> that they had very efficient drainage system which was one of the key features of that civilization they were looking after civic amenities hygienic uh, habitation there were no pyramids here you know there were no hanging gardens of babylon which were built by slave labor you know there were no sphinxes but there were lot of care given to the welfare of the common people it was a democratic kind of a civilization egalitarian civilization which did not have sharp differences between the kings and the slaves and you know things like that you know so a very egalitarian civilization and here is a toy chariot now one of the major arguments against the indus valley civilization being the uh, rigvedic civilization is there are no horses no horse no aryan go the aryans were great horse lovers so go to the next slide there were no chariots they said you know here is a chariot which has been discovered at you know by professor manjul at bagpat and this goes to the indus valley civilizational area in terms of age and the design is exactly the same like assyrian chariot designs the man is holding that design you see the problem is that wood rots in a tropical country so all the chariots which were there have rotted a large number of the palaces were made of wood have you been to nepal to kathmandu have you seen the king's palaces made of all wood and they are magnificent but wood rots sir in a tropical climate so absence of proof limited life uh, you know is not proof of absence here is the chariot which has now been discovered yeah. and as far as the horses are concerned my daughter who's been researching the bimbetka caves now when we went there we found these horses bimbetka caves they they been dated back 11000 to 8000 years ago there are the horses there sir and i have told you that even the uh, saraswati civilization has been dated to 9500 years ago so if there were horses in bimbetka why couldn't there be horses in the rigvedic civilization again the problem is horse carcasses will not be buried in the center of the town they'll throw them outside so where do you look for them and they Correct. deteriorate if they are lying outside outskirts how many graves can you find in which the bones are still intact next slide please amazing slide yeah. so as i was saying birana has been dated to 8000 years is the upper layer and 9500 years is the older layer carbon dated radio carbon dating which is scientific you can't get more scientific than that right and that is the age which has been dated so whom would you believe max muller which put it at just about uh, 3500 years ago uh, less than 2500 years ago or uh, would you rather go for uh, carbon radio carbon dating by the iit khadakpur sir so we have to wake up and smell the coffee next please this is birana you know this is the one which has been dated carbon dated to 9500 years old next please so like i said max muller is not the last word uh, his his findings were very very uh, uh, i would call it whimsical whimsical flippant 
कि मैंने कैलकुलेशन मैंने एक एनवलप मेरे को किसी ने चिट्ठी लिखा था ऑन द बैक ऑफ इट आई सेड ओ सिक्स हंड्रेड इयर्स इज द इज द बुद्धिक सूत्र लिटरेचर टू टू हंड्रेड इयर्स ईच हाँ उपनिषद अरण्यक्स एंड देन द वेद मतलब वो तो ऐसा अप्रोक्सीमेशन है कि मतलब <laughs> it's hard to even take that the- that kind of calculation at face seriously. value but Matlab sir not... in the indian historical circles try talking against uh, max muller and the left Matlab is aise thodi hota hai 200 years aap jodte jaoge bina koi jodte jaoge aur i as a flippant uh, calculation ki mera mood aaya to maine kar diya now because i am a gora <laughs> you will have to live with it दैट कांट बी चेंज सर बाकी सब कुछ भी चेंज हो जाए ये चेंज नहीं हो सकता लेफ्टिस्ट लिबरल मार्क्सिस हिस्टोरियंस आर टूडे ट्राइंग टू टेल यू सर वी आर हेयर टू डिफेंड दीगेसी ऑफ द एम्पायर एंड डेयर यू कालूज डेयर यू ब्राउन आस पीपल चेंज एनी थिंग यू कांट येस वी कैन एंड वी विल बिकॉज वी विल गो इन अकॉर्डेंस विद फैक्ट्स एंड नॉट कलोनियल फेरी टेल्स In conclusion, I'd like to say: Aryan invasion theory into India, or is it out of India? What happens when a vast river, which supports a civilization, dries out? Do more people come in there to the water-stressed area, or do they migrate outwards? Were the people on the east bank of the Saraswati forced to migrate to the Ganga Yamuna Doab? Yes, they did. What about the people on the west bank? Would they? They could easily have migrated to Iran. to central asia to middle east and to europe only an eco catastrophe can change can you know explain this change in pattern of migration you know what the western colonial historian says you see the pattern of invasions all invasions have come from central asia afghanistan to into india so how can the pattern change in the prehistoric area it will change if there is an eco catastrophe if a river dries out dies out then the people have no option but to get the hell out Correct. so you know like i said the asuras they migrated to iran became the zoroastrians you know and uh, the dasa so called asuras were also called dasas they became dahas not the dravidians Dahi. were not the dasas yes that is a figment of the colonial imagination the dasas are the dahas of iran right because they don't pronounced you know sa so dahas it became dahas you know and uh, like i said the danavas whose mother was danu eh? the srauta sutra uh, you know says that they migrated westwards they migrated westwards to mount ararat you know and further up their mother was danu they named all their rivers danu and after danu danube donets dontesk dnipr don and the irish have a mother goddess called danu pagan mother goddess called danu which they used to worship till they turned christian there is a treaty which was signed between the hittites and the mitanni and we've got that tablet recovered you know the the historians when they were digging in mesopotamia and that cites the indran the the vedic gods indra mitra varuna na satya as witness to their treaty so they said oh see that is proof that they came from the west to the east i'm sorry sir it is equally proof that they went from the east to the west and we are questioning the aryan migration theory the aryan invasion theory in two two right and we now need to establish the strategic direction of the indo-aryan transhumanist movement west to east or east to west and i humbly submit that it is east to west it is out of india because of the ecological catastrophe the saraswati died out and in the end you know there is that famous uh, quote by iqbal kuch hai hum mein ki mit sakti nahi kabhi hasti hamari सदियों रहा है दुश्मन दौरे जमा हमारा सारे जहां से अच्छा हिंदुस्तान हमारा इफ यू सी इन दिस स्लाइड ऑन द लेफ्ट इज अट फाउंड टेरा कोटा स्टैचू एट फाउंड इन द सो कॉल्ड इन द सरस्वती सिविलाइजेशन इन द अंजलि मुद्रा द नमस्कार मुद्रा 
and on the right is a Bharatnatyam dancer doing the same mudra today, 9,500 years later. And not only that, this mudra has spread to Tibet, to China, to Japan, to Korea, to the whole of Southeast Asia, to Bali, Sumatra, Java, Boronio, to Sri Lanka, to Burma, to Thailand. They all do this Namaskar Mudra, the Anjali Mudra, and which comes to us from the seals of the Mohenjo, the Harappan civilization. We are 9,500 years old, so help us God. And it is about time that we realized our own true history and we stopped peddling some uh, poppycock theories created by the colonial historians with an agenda to justify colonial rule in India, to try and tell us that there was no Indic civilization, there was no entity called India, they created India for us. And the pity is that we educated people continue to believe it. It's about time that we stand on our own two feet. We may go to the West for research in the STEM subject, science, technology, and maths, etc. You know, uh, because technology is what we need, and we have caught up quite a lot, and we will should be the leaders ourselves. But social sciences? Why do you have to go to America and to uh, England to learn social sciences to learn your own history? Are our historians dead? I mean, they lack brains. It is amazing that we have allowed this situation to continue for so long. And I am very, very certain that amends will be made, that our history books will be rectified to represent the truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you for that uh, amazing presentation, uh, General Sir. Uh, I think a lot of convincing evidence has been presented for this and uh, some of I mean, some of this evidence has been so much like, you know, staring in the face, you know, like you just know when you look at a woman's figurine with a bindi, like it's, I mean, it's, and I also feel that somewhere uh, the oral tradition has, I mean, historical methods can't only take the written, like, you know, part, oral tradition, lived experience, when that stares at you in the face, you can't say ki likha nahi hai, to wo nahi hai. It's a very unidirectional way of looking at history, I feel. And uh, there is merit to look at studying and investigating non-written, non-conventional sources of historical facts as well. I think that is the most important conclusion that I come from your presentation. So, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And uh, we are trying to spread this research so that our people become aware that we have been taken for a ride, that our history needs to be rectified, not because of saffronization of history, but because history must be based on empirical hard facts Absolutely. and not fiction. Absolutely. Not colonial era fiction. Exactly. I think the truth must prevail. That is what we all want. I don't think there is any uh, uh, like... Satya meva jayate. Exactly. With that, we come to the end of today's show. It's been an enlightening conversation and uh, I would like to thank Indic Library which helped connect me to uh, General Sir and it's been a fabulous uh, podcast uh, general sir we would definitely like to have you as a repeat guest uh, <laughs> uh, on multiple topics and i hope you enjoyed the podcast just as much as i did thank you thank you very much jai hind jai hind